Good afternoon, comrades. Welcome to the LLA education session tonight. Uh, we're looking at Eleanor Marx, very important uh, writer, author, and uh, translator of uh, Karl Marx's work. Very pleased to be joined by Anne McShane, a socialist Marxist from Ireland who has been studying Eleanor Marx as well as many other subjects. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, uh, Anne. She'll be speaking for about 30 minutes and then we're opening up to questions and comments from the floor as always. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tina. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak about Eleanor Marx. I should say in the beginning that I'm not exactly an expert on Eleanor Marx in the sense that I've been studying her for a long time. However, I have read the biographies that are available on her, uh, one of which is the biography, the two-part biography by Yvonne Kapp, um, which is an excellent biography, very detailed biography, and also a more recent one by Rachel Holmes. I've also read her writings, um, and they are available on marxist.com. But more than that, I think I've always been very interested in her because of her role in political life in the latter part of the 19th century. And because she presents as somebody who um, is not simply, you know, a daughter of a very famous world historic individual, obviously for us as Marxists, but somebody who had her own political ideas and her own political life. And I therefore think that we need to see her in the context of who she was politically, rather than as, as the person who she was, you know, as the daughter of a very famous person. Um, so, Firstly, um, of course, I need to give you some biographical background on Eleanor Marx. And um, I'll begin by giving you the, the, the details um, of her family life to, to some extent, some a little sketch of it. So Eleanor Marx was born in 1855. She was the youngest daughter of Karl Marx and his wife, Jenny von Westphalen. Um, she was born uh, in London and lived at the family home in Kentish Town along with the rest of her family. Um, she had two sisters and also she had brothers, but they all died in infancy. Um, and she did found out in later life that she had a half brother, Freddie Demuth, who was born as a result of an affair I don't know how long or how serious or whatever that Marx had with the family housekeeper, Helen de Muth. But her, she and her sisters were the siblings, really. They were the ones who were known to be the Marx family. Um, so, um, she, yes. So basically, um, as she was growing up, in the house in Kentish Town, Marx was involved in writing um, Das Kapital. Um, he was involved in setting up the First International, and there were very many activities surrounding that family home. Obviously, intensive periods of writing, um, meetings, because the Marx home was visited on very many occasions by international personalities from, in particular, the German movement um, who came to stay and, and who took part in long discussions with Marx and with Engels who visited there. And also she would have been involved in like attending uh, various events with her father. Um, so she was like born and grown up in, in a deeply political atmosphere and knew people like Wilhelm Liebknecht, who you know, was a, a leading member of the German movement as a family friend, as she did many others. And most importantly, Frederick Engels, who was an extremely important figure in her life and who she worked very closely with, particularly after the death of her father. So, um, as well, of course, with the Marx family 
as well as their political activities. There were very many dramas along the way. Carl was perpetually uh, broke and there were many visits made by him um, to persons, particularly at home or entreaties made to, to the family for loans of money to survive. Engels was always helping them out. He was often ill. There was, you know, there were trips to spas, various treatments and, you know, very many other dramas in the family, which I think in particular, Yvonne Cap draws to her attention really, you know, eloquently and very uh, sympathetically. Um, so, you know, the, the idea of Marx as this patriarch in the family home, well, it's obviously he was a 19th century man. Um, and no matter how progressive his ideas were, that, you know, that fact remained. But it was a lot more complicated than that. I mean, the family, and particularly Eleanor, they were hardly, you know, the girls were not uh, the type that basically didn't argue back. In their home, there was a atmosphere of argumentation, and they certainly would be well able to mock their father and um, joust with him and also criticize him at times. Um, so, okay, so um, she was very close to Engels, as I said, and when she was mainly uh, educated at home, and she so that meant that she was very well read. Um, she spoke German, she spoke English, I think she perhaps spoke French as well, um, but she didn't have a really a formal education. When she was 14, she went to Manchester to visit Frederick Engels, who was living there at the time. And at that time, he was still involved in running his father's factory in Manchester. But he, he gave up, I think it was uh, 1869, she went to visit him and he closed you know, he stopped his role as a as a factory owner at that stage and concentrated on politics totally thereafter. And when she was there, she met Lizzie Burns, who was Frederick Gengel's wife. And um, people may have heard of the Burns sisters, Mary and Lizzie Burns. They were Irish women, um, first generation Irish women who were working in Manchester at the time and whom Engels became close to and married Lizzie, Lydia. And they were uh, very strong Republicans and um, Eleanor was uh, deeply influenced also by Lizzie Burns, who was a staunch Fenian and Eleanor apparently as a child also became a, a staunch Fenian. Um, she would have been affected by events such as the hanging of the Manchester martyrs in around the same period who were Fenians protesting um, against British rule in Ireland. And in any event, she was on, in her own right, a strong supporter of Irish liberation from British colonialism. It wasn't just simply what she had learned or picked up from her father, but it was from her own experience. And in fact, she also visited Ireland at a later point with Engels and Mary Burns following the death of, of Lizzie Burns. Um, so that was a very important part of her life and her, her I suppose, her social network um, to know these Fenians and other Irish people um, in London and as well in Manchester. Um, she seems to have been a very precocious, independent minded uh, young girl, and um, she began to become uh, more involved in politics in the early 18, 1880s. Um, she was her father's secretary um, for, for quite some time and went on various trips with him um, to conferences and meetings of the First International um, until, it, until that itself closed. Um, um, then um, the situation within her family um, began to become more stressful. Her mother was very ill um, in, the, in 1880, 1881, and she nursed her, and then her mother died in 1881. Her sister Jenny, who uh, uh, was married to, I always get confused between Jenny and Laura, 
um, I'm not going to go into details of it. I don't want to be wrong on the question. But anyway, she was living with a revolutionary in France. Um, she died of cancer in 1883, in the January of 1883, and Karl Marx himself died in March 1883. So this was an extremely difficult time for her. Um, they were a very close family, and she was left feeling enormously bereft as a result of these deaths, um, which followed so quickly, one after another. And um, her sister Jenny um, had left children and she was involved in the care of, of, her, of her nephews and nieces afterwards as well. Um, and I suppose at this stage, she began to become even closer to Engels who moved to London and who filled the part that would have been left absent by her father in terms of her political direction and you know, advice and on, on politics and also in terms of personal life. Um, so she then met a man called Edward Aveling. Um, I think she first met him in 1893. Um, and then she became involved with him in 1894. Um, I should say 1884. Um, she she um, was very, they, they kind of worked together as a political couple in a lot of ways. Averling was a strange individual from everything I've read about him. He had been married and was separated from his wife, but hadn't hadn't asked for a divorce and I presume it would have been difficult at the time, but nevertheless, he was married. And the only option that Eleanor had was to live with him, um, which she did. And she declared this to her family um, in 1884. And to be fair, I think they were quite shocked at this because it was something that was very um, daring at the time. You know what, like we're talking about a very different society and for her to decide to live with a man who was married and, you know, become his common law wife was a very defiant thing to do, but she did it. And uh, her father was obviously dead, her mother was dead, her sister Laura um, was quite shocked, Engels was concerned, but you know, everybody accepted it, it was her choice. Um, it, it's been written about at some length in various places, but it's true to say that her relationship with Edward Averling was a very difficult one and that in many respects, it didn't do Eleanor much good to be with him. In some respects, the fact that they worked together politically and worked on some um, uh, writings together, that was useful. But in other ways, he was a man who had a lot of issues, as we would say today. Um, he was mentally cruel to her. Um, you know, he was duplicitous and he had a very bad reputation in the movement. Um, for stealing money and various other scandals surrounded him um, all in, in the entire period that she was with him um, and which she had to cope with and which led to her eventual suicide um, in 1898. Okay, so that's like the personal side of things. And you may think, you know, that she cuts a, quite a tragic figure um, but and that's true in some ways personally she does um, I think it's a great shame that she died so young because I think that she still had so many years in front of her that would have been of benefit to us in the movement today and obviously for herself personally but nevertheless that is what happened okay so her political achievements I'm going to like group these together in order to try and focus on what I think are the most important aspects of it. So I've already said from, um, from the age of 18 for the next 10 years, she spent a great deal of time with her father and traveling with him and getting to know through him um, the politics in particular of the First International. After his death, she was very important in assisting Engels with collating and publishing capital in English, which she, she translated volume one of capital along with Edward Averling 
and this was published um, as the first edition. So, I mean, this was like not a, you know, a, an easy task, as you can well imagine. And I know if there are any comrades among you who've uh, attempted to translate political documents, it's not an, not an easy task at all. It's not like something that like a formal qualification on translation would equip you for. You have to know what you're talking about politically. I myself have done uh, quite a bit of translation from Russian to English, and I found that and I had somebody working with me at the very beginning, and although she was a Russian teacher, I understood my subject far better than she did, and and therefore I think that her and a and, and Averling did understand what they were doing. Um, now somebody may say to me that first edition of the capital in English was a total you know load of rubbish, but I would challenge that because I know that Engels also was involved in overseeing that project, and I believed that you know believe that he would have been very clear with them if they were creating something which was a travesty of the original work. Anyway, so 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 then. In terms of political organizations, she joined the Social Democratic Federation in 1884. And I know comrades on this um, in this LLA will know a lot about, about the SDF and the fact that it was uh, an organization that suffered greatly as a result of the leadership of Henry Heinemann, who was a sectarian. It was an organization that um, was uh, known to be Marxist, and in that, in that sense was, you know, very advanced as compared to many other groups in Britain at the time, but it had, unfortunately, because of um, Heinemann, um, developed a reputation for being sectarian, and indeed it was sectarian, very sectarian at the time. It's a contradictory organisation, I think many respects. A year later, however, she split from the SDF with Averling and she joined the Socialist League, with, uh, which was headed by William Morris and others. I believe that Engels thought that the whole thing was, you know, a whole load of rubbish and that none of it was real in political terms, you know, that these were just sects and that the and that many of the differences between them were founded on individual grievances rather than clear politics. Um, so, you know, that's that's not, I wouldn't think, although although she did write for these and she wrote for those journals um, and she played an important role in um, writing a regular international notes for both the SCF and then the Socialist League. I'm not sure about her role in the disputes. I don't know that she you know, would be somebody that we could point to as a leader in terms of um, creating any kind of a line of demarcation on the question of sectarianism in that sense, although, she's, although she definitely did um, in terms of her trade union work. In terms of her trade union work, I think that she showed herself to be enormously um, able um, to lead the working class movement and to be able to translate complicated ideas into slogans and into the kind of language that people coming into politics for the first time could appreciate and um, get on board with. And so I think she was very influential in that sense as a political leader with trade unionists rather than as a political leader within a political organization, if I'm making myself clear. One, she, she had to set up, uh, she was involved um, 1888, 1889 with the Bryant and May uh, strike of women workers. She then also became involved with the Gas Workers Union and helped to set that up. And in fact, was one of their, I think perhaps an associate member would be the correct title for her um, for many years and close to its leader, Will Thorne. Um, she then was also involved in the campaign for the eight hour day and uh, she spoke on platforms 
and you know like there's there there is in fact if you look at marxist.com there's a transcript of her speech um in hyde park um to the um the thousands i would say there were hundreds of thousands Thank you, somebody just said to me, she was on the executive of the Gas Workers Union. Yeah, so she spoke on this platform in Hyde Park um, of a mass demonstration for the eight hour a day. And she, and that speech is available. And she, she, I think that, and perhaps Matthew can come in on this because he's the person that put forward the point about her being on the executive of the Gas Workers um, a union is that she she was very popular among the working class in London in terms of the organized working class she was very you know she was seen as a friend of the workers and she after her death um you know the the, the funeral um was extremely well attended um by working class leaders in the London area. So yes, in 18, 18, 1880s and 18, late 1880s and 1890s is her period of political activity. So she, um, so I, okay. She became um, involved in the setting up of the process for the creation of the Second International. Now, I don't know whether anybody here has read, read the resolutions, the book of resolutions that were edited, put together and edited with an introduction um, by Mike Tabor um, under the socialist banner. I don't know whether you can see that there. Um, anyway, I really highly recommend it. Um, it's, you can get it from Haymarket. I don't think it's particularly expensive, but it's what it is, it's a fantastic collection of resolutions, which is like a living record of what happened at the conferences of the Second International and show the strong predominance of Marxists, the Marxist current within the Second International. And also there's another book coming out by Mark, by Tabor, maybe early next year when he's gonna look um, more at the debates with the, around the conferences, congresses, and what he what he says is that Frederick Engels was extremely involved in the creation of the Second International, and certainly it's the case that Eleanor Marx was very active on her own and his behalf in in that sense. So involved in attending meetings, reporting back. Um, and also attending the first conference in France in 1889. Um, so I just want to kind of like speak a little bit about that now. Um, when you look at her, when you look at her writings, um, as I said, which are available, you know, wouldn't be all perhaps, but a good summary of her writings on Marxist.com. Um, you can see that they've done a really good job and particularly people like Ted Crawford in transcribing her articles and speeches. Um, so at the 1891 Congress of the Second International, there was a resolution put forward on the woman question by a number of women delegates um, including uh, Louise Kotsky, um, Emma Eerer, um, a, a Russian revolutionary, um, Anna Kulusikov. Um, and Eleanor Marx reported back, um, reported um, on that conference afterwards, and, and particularly on the resolution itself. And the resolution was that the Congress commits itself to energetically fighting for women's rights um, to have the same rights as men and the repeal of all laws placing women outside public rights. So it was a very general resolution, which basically was setting down a marker for the, res for the international that it was going to include the woman's question at the core of its politics. And this was at its second Congress. Um, and Eleanor applauded the resolution and said that 
it clearly, I'm quoting from her, it clearly stressed the difference between the party of the women's writers, or writers, she calls them, who recognize no class struggle, but only a struggle of sexes, who belong to the um, possessing classes, and who want rights that would be an injustice against their working class sisters. And on the other side, the working class party, the real women's party, the working class party, which understands the economic causes of the adverse position of women, of women, uh, working women and calls on them to fight hand in hand. But then she says afterwards, well, it is very good that they pass this resolution, but we don't see what um, is planned in practical terms. It doesn't seem to give us any indication of what is um, going to be done by the international. And this does become a key question in the international. And indeed, um, at the next Congress, um, the question of um, uh, an eight hour day and other issues was raised. And Eleanor was very critical in her report on that occasion of the fact that you had um, opposition to uh, demand for a universal right to vote um, and that you had opposition which would have come from, um, from Britain at the time. And she was very dismissive of the idea that there could be a gradual approach to universal suffrage and that you know a certain section of women with property rights would get it first or in Austria where men would get it working class men would get it before women this was a very um this was a very strong element within the international a kind of a a, a kind of a not progressive but a kind of a, a incremental approach to the achievement of suffrage and instead uh, Eleanor Marx and others like Clara Zetkin, um, Louise Kotsky, who was actually Karis Kotsky's first wife, um, although the second one was called Louise, Louise as well, but this is the first one I'm talking about, were of the view that this was a question that had to be part of the revolutionary struggle of the working class. And indeed, it really was. Now, when we look back today, sometimes people say, oh, well, you know, the right to vote, that was just, you know, that was just some kind of like a civil rights question, which was um, reformist. But in fact, this wasn't the case at the time. At the time, the question of women's right to vote and the working class right to vote, um, and particularly working class women's right to vote was something which was an extremely challenging for the for the bourgeois system and they did not want to accede to it at all. Um, so so that was another question. She's also when you look at her list of um, articles, you will see that she did a review of August Babel's uh, Women and Socialism. And I think that that was in 1885, she wrote that review. And that's quite interesting because she, she does say that he wasn't accurate on some questions and that Engels' uh, origin of the family, which came out around the same time, had shown that there were some issues that Babel was wrong about. Um, and as we know today, you know, both of them were wrong about many issues in terms of practical questions because there was so little known about the primitive society and primitive communism. But what they had fundamentally um, clear was that women under previous forms of human society had been in a far different situation than they were uh, in the 19th century. And that women under the um, in primitive communism had played a role in society which was valued and which gave them status in that society, and even to the extent that they at times had more, you know, had a higher status than men because they because of the way it was organized and because of the fact that the society was socialized 
um, in a obviously in a very primitive way, but where childcare and childbirth and women's work were was included in the collective, and that it was with the introduction of private property that these things, um, all these things were lost anyway. So, so she was very much of uh, very much part of that um, strand of fighters for women's emancipation within the Second International and drew her ideas both from Babel's and Engels, obviously, who was an enormous influence on her. Um, to some extent, obviously, her father would have been, but in terms of the woman question, Marx hadn't written very much directly on that question. Um, but also she was influenced by Clara Zetkin. She attended uh, the Gotha Conference Congress um, of the Social Democratic Party in Germany um, a couple of, in, in around the same period, I'm gonna say, I don't wanna to be too precise with my dates, um, but in around the same period, she attended that and she spoke in great detail about Clara Zetkin and her ideas and her determination that the socialist movement include the woman question at the core of its program. And she also echoed what Clara Zetkin was saying at the time was that there really would not be socialism without the involvement of women and that women's emancipation was something that was, you know, fundamental for men to take up, for men in the movement to take up. And I mean, thinking about it now, like at that time, she would have been faced with a lot more opposition and a lot more ridicule, really, for what she did. And there were not very many women involved in the international, more in the uh, social, so the SPD, but uh, much less in the international. And I think that that would have been an enormously difficult role to play. Um, the the problem a lot of the time as well, and I don't know whether this happened to her, but certainly with Zetkin, it would happen that they would be arguing against the feminist movement, you know, the campaign for um, the right to vote, you know, on the basis that this was about property to women and be putting forward a socialist vision on the question and then be attacked as feminists by their own comrades. So they kind of ended up being stuck in the middle between both. And that certainly happened to Zetkin. And I would say that most certainly would have happened to Elinor Marx as well. So, um, so I think I've like given you something of a, a sketch, which hopefully will be um, useful as a basis to discuss her. Um, and I've said like that, you know, things went badly wrong for her and they did. Averling's um, behavior became much more, I don't know, bizarre, um, I suppose is the word for it. Um, like there's been, there've been, there's been a lot written about him um, and about her as a victim of him. I don't want to dwell on it, but I think it's true. I think it's true that he did. I think he did um, destroy her self-confidence and her self-respect because of the manner that he behaved in, because she had, um, because she had agreed to kind of live in the way she had with him. That's a risk she had taken. Um, and also the other thing that she, I suppose it wouldn't have mattered who she'd been with, was that she was always seen as by being his partner and because he was political as well, she was seen, it was a Mr. and Mrs. Aveling kind of situation. Um, and then that also was quite demeaning at times. Um, so in, in, on the 31st of March, 1898, I think that she was quite, uh, traumatized by recent allegations about him and having to pay off some family for some some things that he was alleged to have done to a, a daughter of a family. Uh, she she 
sent her uh, uh, her the, the girl who helped her a home she's a domestic servant and she sent her to the shop to, to the pharmacy there's a lot of like in discussion about who signed the prescription etc etc anyway and bought poison and then was found dead a couple of hours later um, and she was um, 42 I think when she died so like a young, still a relatively young woman, um, even in those times with another 20, 25 years ahead of her um, in the movement. And I think that it was a, a great loss for the uh, British movement and also for the international that she died so young. Okay, I'm gonna leave it there and hopefully I've given you enough to begin a discussion on her. Thanks. Okay, uh, thanks, Anne. I've managed to get in now as chair, so uh, my apologies. Had some technical difficulties early on. Um, a, a couple of things. Uh, I hope that comrades who would like to ask questions use the raise hand function or use the chat function to ask questions. Um, there are a couple of questions that have come in uh, on the the chat, and one is uh, Anne to ask about uh, Eleanor Marx's relationship with William Morris, if you could develop that. And um, uh, one comrade has uh, made a fairly straightforward statement that Aveling was a bastard. Um, and I think that does seem to be the general opinion. And I'd, I'd like to perhaps just draw on that point, Anne. Do you think that the, the sort of tragic aspects of Eleanor Mark's life, and in particular the relationship with Aveling, has sort of in some ways um, hidden her political contribution. You know, it's very easy to see a, um, you know, a woman who's brought down, or you know, it has very melodramatic uh, qualities uh, in that way. And I wondered uh, if you'd like to talk a little more about that. The other issue, and I think it's, um, I, I think it's quite an important question with your reference to socialism and feminism, is that uh, Eleanor Marx is both um, unique in the sense of her connection with Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels and so on, but she's also, um, I wouldn't say typical, but she's not unrepresentative of what is being increasingly called the new woman. In other words, women who are, you know, going into the public realm, they're acting as uh, political actors. You know, many of them do come from the middle class, but, you know, many of them are working class as well. In other words, she's, um, she is a political actor in her own right. And, you know, the problem with being called Eleanor Marx is that we always think of her as her father's daughter. But when you consider a role with what will become the general uh, municipal and boiler makers union, Will Thorne and so on, the match girls and all the other activities, she's actually a political activist in her own right. And I wonder whether we, um, when I say we, but you know, later generations don't still think of her in a sort of Victorian way. And we don't really talk about her as a political activist. I mean, you refer to uh, Clara Zetkin, but I mean, there's, uh, you know, slightly later, Rosa Luxemburg. You know, there's a whole, um, you know, Alexander Collard, there's a whole slew of um, women political activists who are, who are really, you know, committed to the movement, make a real contribution to the movement. But we still think of them as unusual. And we still... Um, you know, perhaps highlight that aspect. So I just wondered if you'd comment on that. I've, I, some other comrades are going to come in in a second. So I'll, uh, but I wonder if you'd comment on that before we begin. I'm sorry. Sorry, I'm just wondering if I could wait a minute because somebody's coming in and my dogs are barking. So it's going to be mad sounds for a minute. Okay, uh, wants to come okay, in yeah. I'll, ask, um, I'll ask Matthew to come in. In you come, Matthew.
Matthew, could you unmute yourself, please? No. Okay, uh, I thought you were going to promote me to a panelist. <laughs> what the hell's going on? Uh, Matthew, I think I've promoted you to a panelist. Oh, you've done it. Yeah. Okay, you're right. Now you've done it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Matthew, we can certainly hear you. Yeah, okay. Now you can hear. If I can get this camera to work well, two seconds, then yeah. Okay, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's good. I mean, I think the, the, the thing is, as, 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 as Kevin has said, I mean, it, it, she is sort of, well, I suppose, in a way, really the forerunner of a whole <coughs> generation of women. And, I mean, really, if you're looking at the Bolshevik, Bolshevik women, you look at a generation or two later. Um, but you are looking at a group of women, particularly around the Second International, um, and obviously, I mean, you know, she's probably one of the more important ones. And certainly, the, the, the thing that gets me, I think, about about Eleanor is her. She does have the central role in in the actual growth, birth of the of, of, of key unions in this country. Um, you know, she's actually involved with miners in various parts of the country. Um, you know, there's a, involved in international conferences for the miners because obviously she she has the ability, you know, contacts, the ability to do translations, and obviously the, the whole piece. Um, she's involved in the setting up, of the, as I say, the gas workers. I mean, when I was a member of the GNM uh, many years ago, of course it was Will Thorne this, Will Thorne that, and everything. He was everywhere. Um, had his name on buildings and picture everywhere and all this sort of stuff. But as Will Thorne himself said, Eleanor taught him to read and write. He owed everything to Eleanor. Um, you know, uh, and she was actually, you know, probably more influential in, the, in, in, in the origin of that union than he was, but yet has nothing. He, she was also, of course, um, involved in the dock workers strike, the great dock workers strike of, of, of 1888. Uh, which she was she was effectively the secretary of the strike committee uh, so in that sense she's also a founder of the TNG and therefore you know the, the, the unite it, 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 you know has a, has a debt to her also but then go, you know really the, 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 again there's no nothing to mark the fact that she had this enormous impact on, on, on the organization particularly the, the, the you know the, obviously the general what we call the general workers unions you know the the, 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 the uh, unions going going beyond you know many many um you know craft unions and all the rest of it i mean you know, at the same time she was also of course involved heavily involved in the, the big engineers strike as well the, the the engineers federation strike um so yeah in those terms in, this, in union terms she's very very important and politically in these terms but really we we need to sort of say to the you know we need to make the point to to to, to you know the unions in this country they actually stand in her debt and they should mark the fact thanks matthew and i think i think you made a very important point which is that uh, you know the role of marxists in the foundation of unions and of class politics in britain is actually very important and it's often seen as some sort of foreign or alien import. But, you know, the role of people like Eleanor Marx is uh, really significant. OK, next comrade to come in is uh, Ken Syme. Good evening, Kevin. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much, Anne, for, for that talk. Um, I mean, you've, you've touched on this. Uh, the relationship with Aveling to a degree appears to have stifled her. And is it the case that after her involvement with him that her independent work and publication almost ceased? Or did she continue to produce some significant work of her own while she was still involved with Aveling? So thank you again, thanks. Okay. Uh, Anne, would you like to come back and respond? Um, and as I yeah. said, there was also a written question of um, the reference mm -hmm. to a relationship with uh, 
uh, Edward, um, sorry, William Morris. I actually don't know about her relationship, much about her relationship with William Morris, so I can't recall that much about it. I know that they split with him in um, when they were in the Socialist League, that they split with him, that there were rifts in there, but I don't know what the what the details of that were, to be honest. I'd need to go away and look at that. Um, in terms of Aveling, well, so actually, if you look at her, if you look at her political history, she starts to become politically active as an individual in her own right around the time she gets involved with Averling. So his and her involvement map onto that entire period. So she's never really been, um, you know, as an entity on, on herself. Although she is then in other ways. I mean, he's not always there. Like, I don't think when she went to the Gotha Congress, he wasn't there with her. When she was making her speech to the, you know, the throngs of working class people on the international, so on the campaign for an eight hour day, he wasn't there. Um, so it wasn't, it, it's hard to know, you know, I mean, I, I agree with people saying he was an absolute bastard. He was an absolute bastard, but it's hard to know how much he stifled her political development. I think myself that as long as Engels was alive, she had a counterweight to him because Engels was obviously enormously invested in her politically and supportive of her and was able to you know, get her involved in projects on her own. And um, and I don't know whether Averling would have been, I don't know if he was even very controlling. I just know that he was very bizarre in his behavior, but I don't think she didn't really talk about it. You know, she kept it to herself. As far as I know, from what I've read, she didn't discuss it with anybody else. Um, so it was really only at the end everybody found out that how bad things had been um, because she had spoken to a couple of friends not long before she she committed suicide. So I think it's partly the fact that she was seen as his sidekick, like he was the more important of the two of them. Um, and that was a problem in general. And I think that that was the case in the SDF and in the Socialist League. And indeed, even they did a tour of the United States and he was seen as the dominant one in that as well. Although, you know, I don't think, I, I mean, I think he's written quite a lot actually. Um, and um, like from what I've read, he, he was seen in a very bad light, um, but I don't know if that was always the case either. Um, so, so it was a difficult relationship, I would think. And yes, I think it did stifle her political development, but I'm not sure to what extent it did. I would say that what was more important is I don't think that she was in a situation where she could be completely independent or to the extent that we are able to today. Obviously, we're still, we still have women's oppression, but compared to then, where, yes, you're right, Kevin, there were plenty of women doing it, but in relatives terms, they were still a very small number. And like women were expected, women of her class, you know, what, what would she have been lower middle class or middle class depended on, I suppose, on the, the year and the day uh, from, the, from the Marxist point of view, would have been expected to make a good marriage and not very much else. So like even even Marx himself wanted his daughter to make good marriages by, you know, I suppose he wanted them to marry good men, but he also didn't want him, them to marry men that had nothing in their pockets. So I don't know, I think that it was the circumstances of her time made life more difficult for her. In some respects, when you look at the women like Zetkin and um, Rosa Luxemburg, I don't know, they seem to have, maybe in the German movement, there was a bit more modernity. I'm not saying that it was necessarily easier, but it seemed to be more, well, Britain was more, by de facto, more Victorian. Maybe the attitudes there were more um, backward when it came to women. 
But what I do agree with is that I think that she isn't recognised properly for her role in the in developing the trade union movement. And you're absolutely right, Matthew, to point this out. And I had left out about the TNG. Apologies for that. But um, I think that 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 her role in that is has gone unrecognised. And I think that her role as a Marxist in that movement has gone unrecognized because she didn't leave her politics at home. You know, she 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 argued her politics out in a very straightforward way. If you read her articles, you know, she didn't mince her words um, when she was discussing something, when she was arguing for her politics. So I think she 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 is she is a, an important figure, somebody who was one of the very first Marxists to get involved in developing uh, the British trade union movement. I'm going to just mute myself there and ask, let other people come in. OK, thanks, Anne. Uh, Ian Spencer now, please. Hello, Playmates. Uh, I just wanted to ask briefly about the, the question of translation. I've always understood the Marx Aveling uh, translation to be by far and away the best. Um, it's the only one I've read cover to cover, as it were. So, um, <clears throat> what, where's where's the debate there? I, 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 I mean, I, impeccable credentials for the for the translation. Uh, is is there anything uh, to, to to question that? Okay, uh, next comrade, please. Uh, I don't know if you want to come back on on the translation question. Uh, well, just to say that, like her biographers, or well, certainly Yvonne Kapp says, well, she wasn't the most developed political individual. Things like that are said that, you know, which to me, does it doesn't add up because she translated this, this first volume of Capital. You know, that translating isn't a, isn't a technical task, partly yeah. because of that, I should say. Uh, can you still hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah you, no, it's just because, um, of course, the, the Mark Saveling version was the, the official version, as it were. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's the one that appears in the, the collected works of Marx and Engels. Um, and uh, having having read the, the the Pelican version as well, uh, and and I, I mean I don't speak German unfortunately, uh, but from what I understand, uh, the the Marx Aveling version is still the, the finest uh, translation to date. Um, it, it's certainly far more readable than the Pelican edition, I have to say. That, that was here, <laughs> very minor contribution. Okay. <laughs> and would you like to comment on that and uh, uh, particularly her um the fact <clears throat> that she was effectively bilingual in a way that later translators indeed later activists were not well i think the fact that you know as i mentioned earlier she did these international notes um what for at least more, more than a decade for whatever organization she was involved in meant that she knew a lot more and um, been able to speak German um, meant that she knew a lot more also through her connections about what was happening in Germany than many other people did and um you know she had a broad she had a broad range of political interests and views of course as well I didn't mention anything about her aspirations to be an actor and the fact that she wrote wrote some plays didn't she and and she she did act I, I, I myself <laughs> from what I understand think that that wasn't her although something she really wanted to do I don't think it was her best attribute but anyway um I think yeah I think that she she obviously she knew like she 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 did these notes she kept the movement informed throughout what would say the 1880 part of the 1880s and 1890s of what was happening in germany and what the debates were going on and 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 in in other parts of europe as well and also she had a lot of contacts in america at the time 
So she was like she was like a, an important source of information. But none of this has really been looked at. You know, I mean, obviously it's up there. Um, much of it is up there on the site, but it hasn't been considered in the context. You know, like this happens all the time. For instance, um, speaking about two other women, Lenin's sisters, Anna and Maria, they were both on the editorial board of Pravda. They were very important as a connection point for Lenin when he was living abroad in, in uh, Switzerland and in Paris. And they you know, provided him with a lot of information. I mean, they gave him analysis of what was going on. They knew what was happening. They were deeply political women. They played an important role in the sense of putting together the pieces of this movement you know, the people that are involved in the organization, but not only just in the organization, who are talking about what is happening, um, who are developing and in the discussions, political discussions, and as on the Pravda editorial board before the revolution and after the revolution involved in many other things, but they're only ever known as Engel, uh, sorry, as Lenin's sisters, um, mm. and as the ones that like looked after him, had to look after him when he became ill. So I don't, I think that it's the, the time, perhaps it's not just the time, but perhaps it's the time not pe people not being properly recognized then, but also not being recognized properly by the generations that come after them, including our own, um, because of the fact that they weren't, you know, the ones who were signing the major publications, you know, they weren't the ones that wrote the, you know, the state and revolution, um, but they would have been very important in providing the materials and understanding into, you know, creating that process anyway. And a question I'd like to ask you is whether uh, Eleanor had a particular interest in Ireland like her other sisters. Um, yeah, I said that at the beginning. She was she was very very uh, very strong on the Irish question. She, as I said, that she went and lived with Engels in Manchester for some time when she was fourteen, and lived with him and um, Lizzie Burns at the time. And then later, she was uh, she visited Ireland with Engels. He came to Ireland and went on a tour with Mary Burns. Um, and she, yeah, she was very, very strong on this question. And, and as I said that she, he, she, was, she was very interested in the Irish question from her own direct experience and discussions with Fenians like um, Lizzie Burns and Mary Burns. And uh, not just, you know, like it wasn't as a result of her being Marx's daughter, if, if you see what I mean. She had her own experience. But I think what I like about her is that she seems to have been far more than her father, you know, or even Engels. Mm. She was a woman of the people, a woman of the working class. She was just as comfortable or if not more comfortable in mm. a trade union club or in sitting at the you know the table of Lizzie Burns or out among the crowds of people she had that dialogue she had that ability that many others didn't um so she was a popular speaker and uh somebody who had a very profound understanding of struggle um including um anti-imperialist struggle and uh just one last question before I ask other comrades to come in in terms of um developing the trade union movement, particularly the so-called new unions of the late 1880s and into the early 90s. What was the what was the political perspective there? And I'm also interested what her line would have been on, say, the Independent Labour Party that's formed in the early 1890s. Well, what was it? I think the, the new unionism was like her involvement in that was about like advancing working class um, rights at the time, you know, using the opportunity to 
bring workers together in general unions and to take them away from the kind of guilds or the narrower unions and the working class day, the eight hour day was a fundamental part of that struggle. And also, as comrades will know, it was a fundamental demand of the international at the time. So there was, a, she wrote quite a lot on the international struggle for an eight hour day and was that that was a, a, a primary question and also on women and trade unionism that women the, that the that the trade unions had to go out and recruit women she was extremely um active on that question um and what are the ilp the ilp i i can't really comment on to be honest i don't know about enough about that or yeah so maybe somebody else knows more and can comment on that question Okay, no, I um, I, I wonder because the the picture I I get from you of her and indeed my reading is that she's somebody who is um, becoming involved in this new phase of the movement, and is um, you know I I don't mean this in the pejorative sense, but as an activist, she's involved in in this new movement. She's trying to explain ideas to masses of people and you know is therefore engaging in a way in the earlier period when marx is writing in you know with much smaller groups so i'm i'm always interested in that sort of movement from uh the the sort of small group of uh, revolutionaries to the mass movement and that's why i wondered about the the ilp um i know Eng i know engels had a particular line on it and i just was interested in her view and also, of course, she would have lived into the early, oh, sorry, the late 1890s. So she would have seen, you know, many of the uh, many of the developments in that way. Yeah. Um, comrades, I don't see anybody else putting their hand up. Uh, it's the last call really for questions and uh, comments. Uh, it's maybe the heat has uh, has all got to you. Um, so any comrades who would like to come in, but um, uh, if not, I'll ask Anne to sum up uh, what has been a very interesting talk. Okay, and I think uh, just uh, sum up now, please. Okay. Um, well, thank you for giving me the opportunity again to speak on her. All I've really given you is like a thumbnail sketch of Eleanor Marx's life. And I'm aware of the fact that I'm not able to answer all questions, but I didn't really set myself up to do that. I just wanted to introduce her as somebody who deserves a far greater focus as a leader of our movement. And that somebody, and I didn't want to get in too much to her personal life because often that's something that everybody uh, focuses on because it is it isn't of it isn't uninteresting you know it isn't irrelevant because it shows the circumstances that existed for women like her at the time and she was somebody who was uh, uh, in many ways well before her time mm. um and I think particularly what Matthew says about Eleanor Marx deserving recognition as a founding member of a British trade union, a major British trade union, um, is, is, is definitely a, a thing that we, we should talk about more um, and maybe look into both that and also her involvement in the second <clears throat> international. That's what I would say are the two, her two greatest uh, contributions and, uh, and are questions that deserve a uh, far greater examination. <laughs> um, somebody's dog wants to go out, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so thank you. And thanks for, you know, being here in this heat. I mean, even in Ireland, it's, it's too much for me. So I can imagine what you're like over there in Britain. <laughs> Bad. Yeah.
So. Okay, thanks very much, Anne. And it was an interesting talk. And I think you've really brought the main essence home, particularly about the way that Eleanor Mark stands for a whole generation of women activists who were developing politics in that period and uh, you know were later going to become so uh, so significant w one thing i would ask comrades to do and that is to go on to uh, marxist.org where there's a lot of writings of those marxists from that period and it's a, it's a great um, it's a great resource just to look at that writing and also to read about them as as uh, as, as Matthew and other comrades have said, you know, the, the British labor movement often writes out its revolutionary elements and people like her, you know, really deserve that, um, you know, that attention. So I think what we're trying to do in the, um, you know, in the series is to point up the lives of left-wing activists who've often been written out of history or have been, you know, framed in particular ways and I think Eleanor Marx stands for a whole number of women who, um, you know, made a really great contribution to our movement internationally. And, uh, you know, thanks very much, Anne. Uh, that was uh, an interesting talk. Um, before we go, just a reminder that next week's session um, will be one I'm sure that many comrades are interested in. And that's uh, the, uh, the Lives of the Left series. And that will be on Leon Trotsky who is an entirely uncontroversial figure. And um, in that way, um, I'm sure it will just be a very uh, uncontroversial discussion. So uh, if, if comrades would um, look on the LLA site, we have a number of other sessions uh, coming up. Uh, just to add my apologies for last week, which was the first time I think in two years that we'd not been going, and that was because of a uh, you know, a, a, a particular family question for the speaker, but we'll bring in David uh, Broder to talk about Gramsci. And uh, I just thank all the comrades uh, for attending. And uh, again, thank Anne for a very interesting uh, discussion. So thanks very, uh, thanks very much. Um, and um, I'll, uh, I'll see you all next week. <laughs>